get my sexy radio voice on. No, I'm upset. That radio was, DJ. That was a bad joke and everyone's upset. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of APIs You Won't Hate, the podcast version. And yeah, I'm excited. Once again, I'm running the show. No mic to help me out. So bear with us. I think it's recording. I guess you'll find out. Um, today, I am joined by David Shanley, who you may have heard all over the place. He's popping up. I, I was talking to him at API Days in Paris recently, and he's made a whole bunch of really cool tools. So, David, do you want to tell everyone a bit about yourself? Thank you for having me, Phil. Yes. Yeah, so, my name is Dave Shanley. I go by the name of Quobix. You know, but you know, that's just you know a stupid internet thing. But anyway, Dave, Dave Shanley. Oh, I, uh, I I called you David. Sorry, I I, I go I, I'm I'm posh now. I go too formal. That's what I'm saying. Just Dave. No problem. No problem at all. So I'm the founder of Princess Beef Heavy Industries or <laughs> PB33F. You know, it's, 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 it's shorter to write, but it's just longer to say in all, in all, of all forms. And what I, is that name about? Tell us some more about that before you get back to the intro. Yeah. So actually I was, I was thinking of, you know, what do I call, what do I call, what would I call myself or what I call my company? And it was actually my two-year-old daughter, well, she was two at the time, and she came up with, she used to watch this show, it was Blaze and the Monster Machines, which is a show about monster trucks. And she said, I want to watch Princess Beef. I'm like, what? Princess? Princess Beef? There's no mentions of princesses or beef or anything like that in the show. She just called it Princess Beef. So, then, you know, actually it was a little while longer, she said, but she was playing the drums, like toy drums, and she called them the honey drums. And I put the two together and thought, Princess Beef and the honey drums. Isn't that a great name for a band? If I was younger, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. I, thought, I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. But then I thought, you know, a bit too much for a company name, but Princess Beef. And then I looked it up and there's already a company called Princess Beef. They're a ranch in Colorado, I think, and they, oh, they, they raise cattle. So I thought, okay, well, how do I differentiate it? And I was thinking back to, you know, my, my, my 90s roots and there was a wonderful company called Loft Heavy Industries, or 10PHT, depends on how you, you would say the acronym. It was a hack, uh, think group, hack, hacker tank, think tank type thing. And I just loved that heavy industries element. And there was like a bunch of skater companies that had heavy industries on, on their, you know, post to the name. I thought, why not? Let's, let's go right back to the 90s and re, re, relive all of this. this joy. Anyway, so that's the, that's the reason why it's called that. No, that's nothing brilliant. else. Okay, so love, punk, just, I love punk it. software. I like the approach. I'm, I'm, I'm apparently trying to do like the punk version of the Woodland Trust. So I like the, the punk version of software. Let's yeah. to keep it interesting. All right, brilliant. So I interrupted you, but you were telling us a bit, bit more about what, yourself and what you get up to. Yes. So I'm the fa founder of Princess Beef. I'm also, you know, that's, that's what I do by, by night. But I also have a full-time job as a distinguished engineer at a company called Splunk. If you haven't heard of it, it's like we do big data, collect all the logs, all the information, mm. put it into our big index and allows you to make sense of it. And we build premium applications on top of that platform. So yeah, that's what I do during the day. Nice. I have I, heard I, of I, them. What? Yeah. The, that's, it's like a pretty big deal, right? It's, it's like a pretty big company or how many, a few other. Yeah. It's, but there's, there's, there's about 8,000 people in the company, maybe 9,000 now. It's okay. pretty large. It's actually just been bought, acquired. Well, it hasn't closed yet, but Cisco has just purchased it for 27 billion. Which makes Good it the Lord. third largest. Yeah, it's a large, large amount of money. So yeah, we'll see what, ha what happens with that. But how much of that do you get? Zero point zero 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 one percent. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was a number at the end of all those zeros, though. So there is something. There is something. There is something. There is definitely something. But uh, yeah, definitely not what the CEO is going to be walking away with for sure. No, fair. All right. Well, that's 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 news. It's not it's not bad news. It's news. Fantastic. And so on the side, you're working on a bunch of really cool stuff. And so, yes. yeah, I, we, we spoke a bit, you've been helping out with openapi.tools, the website that lists, guess what, a bunch of open API tools. I don't know why I expanded on that. It's in the name, it does what it says on the tin, but we'd been a little bit snowed under and you were helping with some pull requests and I appreciated that. And then, yeah, I got to see you give a talk at API days in Paris. I went over there running about who needs some work Do you need some work. Can I write for you? Oh God, work, you know, work, work, work is hard when you don't have a regular, regular job. I just had to go and like, it is. Me. Yeah. You know, it is, yeah, and lots of talking <laughs> to people. <laughs> lots. Yeah. It was the first time I've actually had to do networking, right? Like normally I just turn up at a conference and I'm like, 
the company I'm working for pay, paid me to be here. Here's my talk. I'll be at the pub from here on out. But this time it was very much like I actually need to go to every booth and shake every hand and talk to everyone and see if anyone has any paid work for me. Anyway, seeing your talk was was a, a nice, refreshing break from a lot of like, AI will save the world and you don't need to Thank build you. an API. You don't need to build an API ever because you can just get AI to do it. Although you have to write a specific API for the AI to work. Just a, a lot of very silly talks. But brilliant I talk. Agree. We, we won't get onto that tangent. Good talk from you. <laughs> you were, it, it was, <laughs> I really enjoyed the talk considering you spent the, a good half of the talk making fun of Spectral, a tool that I helped to build. So I did what any rational human being would do. And we all, we went to the pub and shot the shit and it was great. Was, yeah. You built, you built vacuum, which is kind of like a go the equivalent of, of spectral and to save me butcher in the introduction, like tell me, tell, tell our listeners a little bit more about vacuum. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's inspired by spectral. It's, it's, it's based on the same concept. So it's compatible with spectral's rules and core functions and things like that. So you, in theory, you should be able to take a spectral rule set, plug it into vacuum, and it'll give you the same results. There's, there's, there's different logic in it. It's, it's built differently, completely different. It's different architecture. But the reason why it exists, and now I was making fun of some of the speed, was, 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 because, of the, <laughs> was because of the speed. Yeah, yeah. So I'll take, I'll take you back to the, the kind of origins of it. It was around night 2019, and I was working at a company called VMware. It doesn't exist anymore. It's been bought by Broadcom. But yes, yeah, but the, 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 the big thing there was, you know, there was a huge, there's thousands and thousands of open API specs and there was, some were generated, some were handwritten, some were rubbish, some were just didn't even work, but these were all being just pushed out as documentation mm. to customers. And they were just rubbish. They were just terrible. They didn't work in code generators. They, they, the, the documentation was awful. It, it just didn't load. It was, there was no SEO. You couldn't discover it or all, all kinds of problems. Anyway, so I got tasked with this problem. It's like, can you start figuring this out? Can you start figuring this mess out? And the first thing I did was, okay, let's go and grab some tools from the internet. So I started grabbing documentation tools and linting, grab Spectral, started running it. And it was doing fine for the smaller specs, you know, the yeah. smaller SaaS services. But when I fed in, there's a product of VMware called vSphere. This thing was built in 2006. And it has... 10,000, 20,000 APIs, it's an ungodly amount of APIs, and all these models are object oriented. I fed some of those specs in, and they were like 70, 80 megabytes a piece. Spectral just did give us a response back. It just, it just oh, never yeah. came back. It went off, never came back. So, like, okay, what do we do about that? So, started, we actually tried to build a tool internally to replicate Spectral and failed absolutely miserably. It failed. Couldn't do it just because Spectral was, it's so complicated and did such a good job. Yeah, yeah. It, was, you know, it does so a lot so of different things together. as well. Like the way it does, so yeah. One thing that people always kind of forget about with linters, like when you've got a code based linter, you can usually look at that file to find out if that syntax is correct. Or you can, you can kind of use reflection APIs in PHP to use the PHP term. You can look at the reflection API to load it up and be like, does the name of this function look right to you? But it, it, but you, you know what line that, that file is on. Well, that function is on and you, and it's, it's a lot easier to, to work with individual files, which is therefore quicker than it, than with open API, because you have to build all of the structure into memory. Like you have to follow every single ref of which there might be thousands and then build kind of like a, an actual map, a fully referenced map of that, which gets quite chunky. And then you have to like find out if something is a problem in every single location, what it is used, like the. The issue might not be in the file you're looking at. It's when that file is, is refed into a place and now it's a problem. And then, and then a lot of tools have done that. Like Specky, the thing that kind of inspired Spectral did that, but then it couldn't tell you which file the problem was in. So you have to kind of go up and down into these different formats and like map everything to a different place. And it's bloody confusing to do. So it, I can only imagine, is. like I've, I've played with the Spectral source code quite a lot. I didn't write it, but I was like the product manager there for a while and yeah every time i look in there i just go mm, mm, someone else can work on that i'm not gonna have it. i'm not, not gonna even try it and you know the, so and i discovered that when after so long story short we were trying to run spectral with some of this tooling couldn't get it to run at the speed that we needed it to so i said look let's let's rebuild it and vmware said no and i was like all these other tools that we built I said let's open source them and they're like no we're not going to do any of that so i was like okay then. I want to, I want to give back to the community. I want to work on this stuff. I want to build this linter. You won't, you don't want to do it. I don't have a future here. If you don't want to work on it, so I'm out. So when I, when I basically nice. quit and started building it from scratch. So 
going through that process of day zero, blank slate, okay, I'm going to build my own version. I'm going to take Factual as a template or as, a, as, a, as an inspiration, look at the source code and then reimagine that and go. And I spent two months rewriting that reference lookup, trying to figure that out. Recursive logic, months, months of scratching my head and I failed multiple times. I couldn't get it to work and I couldn't get it to work fast. So trying to make that work, you know, the work that was done on Spectra was, was phenomenal. It took me months and months just to wrap my head around how to get the logic together. Eventually I pulled it, pulled it, pulled it together, but I was having like recursive dreams. Like I was waking up, you know, in the same like loop <laughs> in my head, like trying to program my way through a dream, you know, in this yeah, recursive yeah. stepping in way. Anyway, it was driving me nuts, but yeah, got there in the end. And, and the whole purpose was to, I want to be able to generate a Spectra report or a report but I want it to run fast and I need yeah. a, a language that's more suited to do this type of stuff. You know, ideally it would have been in Rust or done it in C++ or something, but you know, I was familiar with Go, loved Go, been using it for years and it's almost mm. as fast, you know, you know, it's not, yeah, as, yeah. not as fast, but yeah, almost as fast. So that it would, it would do the job. Plus there's a, there's a pretty large community for Go. So yeah, it's been like four months, five months building it, you know, just every day. Damn. Chop away, chop away, chop away, threw it away, start again, start again. <laughs> Eventually I got a design that actually worked and worked well and was something I could then add on to and scale up and open sourced it and said, you yeah, know, what do you think? You know, nice. First Ow. few months there was zero. It was like, no, it was crickets, but yeah, it's time to take <laughs> on. That's wild. I mean, yeah, the, in, the entire API linting, when was vacuum released? A year or two ago? Yeah, it was 2022, like April. Or May. Yeah, I gotcha. So that's, that's like linting is a thing now by 2022, right? Like that, that's it still kind of early days, but in, it's been the last year or two where it's really taken off. All of the tooling vendors are working on it. They've either, you know, they've either baked Spectral in under the hood, like Postman did, or even Smart Bear have kind of replaced their, their own kind of mostly regex or whatever based linting with Spectral under the hood. Now they've acquired Stoplight. Or they're working on their own kind of thing, or like everyone's everyone's into it now. It's a thing. It, like it didn't exist as a as a it didn't exist more than conceptually in bullshit hacks until until about then. So yeah, now now we're on to the the good uptake, the good part of the hype cycle, where it's not just early adopters; it's loads more people, and people are looking for different tools, and they might not want something yeah. in JavaScript, they might yeah. not want something that's slow, and that and they might not something you know. Some people want things that are CLI based or like other different types of interface. We've got the rate my open API app that's turned up that you've been helping out yeah. with. So that's by Zooplo, but you know, they, they're running on, on vacuum. And then there's, uh, I did a review of these two API insights. As in it's a by Treble, right? Treble. Yeah. And yeah. so I've had them on the podcast recently, and I've done a review on APIs you won't hate blog about those two tools, but they're both more visual instead of CLI based. So we, we've gone from a world where like these tools didn't exist to now where like these tools are aimed at different types of user and different types of use case, which is a brilliant place to be because now we're all sharing ideas and powering each other and improving things. And there is a bit of a, in, in my head, coming from like a, a background with standards bodies, I'm like, why are there five different formats? <laughs> you know, there's like, you thankfully have gone with a spectral compatible thing and maybe that will change in yes. the future. But then there's kind of the redoc Lee which is its own more simple DSL, but simpler, but somewhat less powerful. And then potentially. And then there's the open, uh, there's the optic CLI, lint GPT, which is like, you can just send it a string of human words. And if you, you know, ask the wizard nicely, it will, it will give you the thing you want and review of that on the blog recently as well. So we're in this amazing place where there's loads of linting going on and, and I'm into it. I think vacuum from what I've seen is, is blooming brilliant. And I think your choice of language in go is, is probably isn't going to be a limiting factor to the speed, right? I think. A, a big benefit that you've got there is the way that it was architected. I think Spectral is kind of tipping his hand as being in initially a utility of Stoplight Studio, where you're editing a bunch of files and whether they're local or on the cloud, it has all the files kind of local. It, even the, even the cloud version would clone the entire repo into your browser and have all of those files like there. Really? Yeah, it would wow. clone it somewhere, it'll clone it into local storage and then you could kind of access it from there. And basically mm. the idea was you'd kind of, you'd run it and it would get an idea of all of your open API and then you'd, you'd edit one model and it would go, all right, let's just update that one model in, in the storage and it would run it from there. So it's more meant to 
lint while you edit, which is quite fast because it does the initial upfront load and then it's just like, oh, you change this bit, change this bit, change this bit. But yeah, like mm -hmm. when you've got, you know, what's the, you, you were using GitHub, the GitHub example, which is monstrous and Stripe as well. They're both huge. And uh, yeah, when you just say, go and figure that whole thing out, it just kind of weeps and <laughs> just can't handle it. So yeah, it's great to see these different use cases being covered by, uh, by different approaches. And I can only imagine how hard that was to, to build from scratch. Yeah. It was, it was an adventure. It was, it was, you know, it was definitely putting my imposter syndrome on full tilt, you know, standing there thinking, why can't I figure this out? You know, why can't I get this algorithm to work? Why is it getting stuck? Why is it spinning out? Why are these threads paused? Why is it locked? I mean, it was just every, mm. every time I tried to do it. So, you know, hats off to the engineers working on Spectral because solving that problem, you know, and doing it in a way that works consistently, very, mm. very, very hard. Very, very hard. Do you have, you mentioned there wasn't that much adoption at first. Is, is a thing's been picking up? That's where I started to go with my like hype cycle ramble. Yeah, there's so it, it kind of it, it's it, it goes through little waves depends on whether there's a holiday or not. Like uh, the traffic <laughs> to the docks, it's weekends, ghost town. Monday morning, straight again, you know, spikes up. So it's very much following that kind of business, you know, peaks and troughs. So over Christmas, it kind of dipped a bit, but then it was, you know, it's up to about between 11, 12,000 downloads a month by NPM. It's had nearly half Sweet. a million downloads. So it's, Wow. It's doing, it's yeah, doing well. Yeah. It's, doing, it's, it's moving. It's not where I'd want it to be, obviously, but it's definitely mm -hmm. moving. Yeah, you know, from where. Oh, yeah, it and I saw that. So it can be installed by NPM as well. Yes, that that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, because things I've never I've never tried running Go in like GitHub Actions or whatever. I'm sure it's fine. But whenever you ask people, like most open API tooling is in JavaScript. It seems to be like a really Node heavy community, and yeah. not entirely sure why that is, but it is. And it's so it's it's always good to see other languages kind of getting involved but then because so many people are used to npm it's good to have that covered as well because if you're if you're if you're currently running spectral you could just run vacuum and, and see if it works better i mean for that's you. where the majority of the downloads come from is from npm use mm. whenever i speak to people on the forums or they come to discord they, they're they're running it or installing it via npm or docker those two the the most right. popular which is really surprising for me you know i, I thought you know most people would want to be installing it you know, as a CLI tool and have it as a binary, just, you know, yeah. using homebrew or via a shell or something. But no, it's Docker. Yeah, Docker and NPM, most popular. <laughs> Sweet. Was, yeah, very surprising. Nice. Well, yeah, great. You give people a bunch of different installation options. And where, where's it at and where's it going? What's the plan for Vacuum? Yes, that's a great question. So the, the, the kind of, the purpose of what I've been working on recently, or up until this point, was to be able to get it to a state where it's consistently operated. The, the, the bugs that I can fix, I can solve, are mostly mostly cleared. And to be honest, the majority of them live outside of Vacuum. It's actually in Lib Open API, which well, we can mm. talk about in a bit. And that, getting that, that's, that's kind of the beating heart of everything. And getting that to a point where it's working for all the use cases of all the variations from the very, very complicated to the very, very simple. Basically, I wanted it to stop blowing up because I actually <laughs> run it as a demo in the pipeline. And when I first put it up, you know, that every day it, it just panic, 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 and it would reset itself. You know, it's like a tiny little container. Yeah. But I was just watching this just blow up over and over and over again, and I fix those bugs, and then I wait, wait for it to spin out of control, and that stopped happening now. So now it's mm. it's not blowing up anymore. It's not spinning out of control. It's consistent. The error reports I'm seeing are very, very limited, or things I already know about. Nice. So that's been the goal: is to harden it, get it to the point where it's I'm happy to say it's going to run you know, consistently now, wherever it yeah. is. The next piece is to start making it more usable. So for example, like you, like you were talking about with the rule sets and rules and the syntax of the DSL and doing JSON path queries and figuring out functions and function options, it can get a bit hairy, particularly with, you know, you know some really complicated rules. And then you're adding in custom JavaScript functions, right. all of that kind of, is it working? Can I test it? How do I know it's working? You need some kind of you know, tool to be able to test your rule sets, test your rules, test your paths, test your functions, test your logic. That doesn't mm. exist right now. Yeah. So that's the next step is to, to allow you to it, see your spec, see the linting, so enable it to work with a language server so we can plug it straight into VS Code and you know, make a VS Code extension nice. and then bring that even further so you can have a rule set editor and a rule editor and a you know, try out your JavaScript function, see if it works. You know, does it, what does it pick up? What does this pick mm. up? What happens? What's the outcome? 
but like a you know like a sound bit or a sandbox for rules and rule sets. That's where we'll go funny. next with it and improve the the rendering. Right now, there's an HTML report which I think is pretty good, but I could do better, do much better. Sweet. Well, it's exciting to hear that because I think the the dev experience, like anyone. Anyone who's tried writing a bunch of spectral rule sets will know that it can be very hard. I'm currently updating the spectral OWASP security rule set for security, what, the top 10 2023, because of the previous report was 2019. And yeah, like I'm, I'm doing zany stuff and I, it's hard work. And I think it was always discussed at Soplight a long time ago that the plan was to build some sort of dev experience to help people do that, but it, it didn't get around to materializing because the, the effort was put into like making hosted rule sets where you could, instead of editing a YAML file on your computer, you've got a nice GUI for working on them, but that GUI mm. was replacing the YAML file. It wasn't replacing the, 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 the guts or the experience of working out what rules to put in. And so e even like a regexpow.com equivalent of like, here I am typing in a rule here, you can see it's selecting the right bit of open API. Now, what would you like to do with it? anything yeah. along those lines would really help. It's why I build them as NPM test suites, because I could just type like NPM test, NPM test, NPM test, and just like randomly bullshit my way towards getting to the correct solution. But that that's the key thing, because this is why we've seen people making wizard based approaches or like nicer DSL based approaches, because the JSON path thing is so complicated and, and custom functions can be so difficult, but I don't feel like you can just avoid that problem with the DSL, like with it there's there needs to be something in the middle or just the dsl you can only do what the dsl does but leaning forward into like i'm going to combine json path plus regex base like with regex in it and like have no way of knowing if that's working well or not apart from like trying it and seeing what happens exactly no, neither right. of those just, are particularly good experiences <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly that. It's that you just you just keep hitting it with a hammer over and over and over again until you see something. Having some kind of guide, some like feedback. It's you're doing it wrong. Mm. You're doing it wrong. I've tried to capture that with some of the linting rules. That right. one thing you don't get with I haven't seen anyway with spectral is like here's how to fix this problem. It's like here's your mm. problem, but here's what you go and do to go and remedy it. And here's some docs of a good example and a bad example. Yeah. So That's doing pretty. that same type of thing, but with, you know, the dev experience, you know, your rules wrong, it's not finding anything. This is what it's picking up. This is, this is what you think you're getting, but this is what you're actually getting type of thing. Yeah, I gotcha. All right. We could talk about linen stuff for ages and that's why I wanted to get this one done first, but you've built loads of other tools as well. And so wiretap is really cool. A, a, a mocking server aiming to do some of what prism was meant to do, but prism kind of got left behind in prioritization a little bit and hasn't really done many of the things that it wanted to do when it, when it started off, unfortunately. So tell me a little bit about Wiretap and Yeah, great. Thank you. So Wiretap, it actually started, this, 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 this is something, it's like a real, u, real life use case that I have at Splunk. There's two things. First, the way that, our, that we build our premium applications at Splunk, we were using Webpack Dev Server for all of our front-end stuff. So, you know, we, we load up our front-end and it will make all these API calls at the back-end. Problem is, is that you know, when we were running this thing for I don't know, a few hours, it would start to choke. Right? The, the whole thing would just start, you know, API calls are failing, weird errors are coming back. It was caching some weird stuff. It was just, just didn't work. You know, it didn't work at scale. Great for smaller stuff, but when you start using it at scale, didn't work. So we had that problem there. The next problem is we have all these front ends and back ends, and some of them have a open API specs, some of them don't. And we don't actually know if any of them were compliant with each other. We don't know if the back end's been implemented properly. We don't know if the front end's been implemented properly. And we don't, well, obviously the API, open API spec is in, in one condition as well. So problem A is we're struggling with how to build our UIs in the front end. Problem B is we, we can't tell if our API traffic is compliant, front end or back end. And there's the third problem, which is mocking and front end mocking. Obviously you've been in software development, you know, the front end moves at a different speed from the back end. So we get a bunch of requirements from PMs mm. and the back end team start moving at this, you know, a glacial speed and the front end team are all like mocked up and ready to go with the UX, but there's no back end. What do we do? How do we move forward? So with API first, with an API first methodology, working on the contract first, we can then take something like wiretap and, and mock it out. So we can have a front end working with the contract whilst the back end does, you know, their implementation. So it solves those, those three problems that we, that we have. And, you know, so. The way that we use it today is it powers our, our, our local dev suite. 
So all the UI developers, they, when they run npm start, it actually spins up Wiretap. It's not spinning nice. up Webpack. Yeah. And we can run up, we run Webpack as a watcher. So it's recompiling all the JS and the CSS in the background. So it spins that up and then we start capturing all the, all the API traffic. So the other thing that it does, well, it's primary goal. The, 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 that's what I wanted to build it for, but I always just saw these other use cases as well. Primary goals was mocking and API, open API mm. validation. So whilst it's serving all the static content, any APIs, it can, it reads them in and you can configure them with, you know, allow lists and deny lists and things like that. You can do path rewriting. A lot of the stuff that you nice. get from like, like Webpack Dev Server, it's actually a drop-in replacement for a lot of those features, like, you know, variables and authentication tokens and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, it act as a proxy. A, a complete transparent proxy for all of your APIs and remap them if they need to, but it mm. captures all the API traffic and allows you to, you know, validate the, the requests and responses and does schemas and, you know, headers and effectively looks at the whole open API contract in detail and then shows you which of your requests are invalid, you know, how, how compliant are you? And then you can Brilliant. see where those, those, those violations are and you know, it gives you numbers to straight to the spec. That's something that was missing from a number of tools is the ability to get to like, here's your problem. Here's why it's wrong. Here yeah. it is in the spec. Here's where it is in those line numbers. And in Go, that functionality was missing from, from a number of other libraries that are out there. So I got anyway. you. That's pretty handy. But yeah. the, that, that's always been, that's been the goal of so many tools that kind of the contract validation stuff, I think is really important. So when we talk about validation, there's two types and so vacuum tools like that, the linters, they are schema validators. Like is my schema correct to whatever rules I may have defined to the spec and to my preferences. But then there's the, I call it data validator, which I've never said out loud and is annoying and I need a different term now. But data validation doesn't sound so bad, but yeah, the goal of that is like, and is the data, is the, this, is this instance of JSON or whatever valid to what the schema said it should be. And, and that's pretty bloody key when people are. Yeah, if you're doing the API design first, then you can, your, whatever your teams in general will agree on a contract and then everyone has to build to that contract and, and your front end teams want to build to it and your back end teams want to build to it. And if the, if the clients are sending things that don't conform to the rules, someone should tell them. And if the back end team is also like emitting stuff that isn't right, someone should tell them too. And yeah. I think we kind of aim to do that with Prism with you. You, you can build a mock server. So if the backend doesn't exist, you've got the mock server yeah. and you can just talk to the mock and it will let you know if you're doing it wrong. And then once yeah. you've actually got the, once you've actually got the API, you switch that mock to a proxy and it will still put the same traffic through pretty invisible. Just there's a bit more business logic happening. Tax rules might actually be applied instead of just static examples coming back. That was kind of the plan for the prison. Sounds like you all do the same thing too. But what yes. I really liked about it was you, you've got a built in like a go terminal, like a UI thing. So you can actually see the requests that have gone through, see which ones passed, see which one, which ones failed. And if you wanted that with, with Prism, you, you didn't really get it. Like you could sniff on some headers. I think we had like a X hyphen something or other responses, evaluation errors, kind of JSON that you then have to like unfurl somehow, but yeah, having mm. it in that terminal built in, otherwise you've got to go and have another proxy installed, like go and set up Charles proxy or go and like, right, set up, you know, right, yeah. some sort of sniffing thing, which is a bit of a pain in the backside. So. Yeah, having that all in one place is is pretty handy. And especially if that's one command that your front end people can write, maybe the front end people aren't, aren't the ones that want to set up Charles Proxy. So yeah, that's that's really handy. Yeah, so it was, it was that, it's the same thing with vacuum. Like there's a console CLI, there's a sort of terminal CLI, there's a way HTML mm. report. So with Wiretap, it's got the same thing that uh, that's you, know, you can run it, run it as a service. It runs, it actually powers some other stuff as well, but it runs as a service or it runs as a, you know, as a, as a, a local, local UI, yeah. local GUI to be able to, to, to view it. And cause that, part of that the, can you know, be the, a faff. The... I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say it, it, it can be a faff. Yeah. When I've said in the past, some teams, some front end teams, like I'm, I don't, front end teams are perfectly smart and the front end stack is a lot more complicated than the back end in so many ways. But yes, when you give them a new tool, if I've tried to say like, oh yeah, just install like prism and point it at this open API file and then like pass these options or whatever. And they're like, I don't really want to do that because then they've got, you know, trying to get the, the proxy information out, it's a bit of a faff, but when I, if you can host it, then you can just <laughs> like change an environment variable and say like, just point your front end at this instead of pointing it at that, or it's completely seamless to them. Like just point it at the API and you don't even need to know that it's running the proxy right now. We've just switched that into place. That, yeah, that makes it yeah. a lot more useful for those teams that don't want to figure out a new tool right now. 
that's it was exactly that use case is how 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 do I make this completely transparently replace the thing that's giving us our dev experience right now and serving all the content and making all the API calls and proxying them to our staging servers? How do I replace that mm. with you know so it's completely transparent so that even the npm commands are the same in the script it's just it's you know they don't have to think about it that's yeah. what obviously obviously makes the adoption so much easier because you know it's just it's just all of us all of a sudden one day it's just it's not breaking anymore <laughs> yeah brilliant all right again loads of other stuff i could talk to you about this about this is mostly just a chance for for me to nerd out with someone who's working on the exact same problems that i spent years working on so hopefully hopefully some other listeners like this but it's fun for me at least anyway so. the next one which <laughs> otherwise is a massive waste of time hello is this thing on the another thing you've been working on which i always wanted to get involved with but never had the chance is kind of changes and change detection mm. so this is yes. a new a new area that's kind of popping up for people is we've now we've now spent enough time with the api design first life cycle or whatever is going on enough people are making open api and describing their apis well um they've learned how to you know describe it well with with good standards and they've learned how to make sure it's true by using contract testing in their test suite or prism contract testing style proxies that stuff's done great now it's in production and people are making changes and shit's breaking because people love making breaking changes and there's an increasing number of tools that are coming out to i, I haven't looked at how open api changes actually works but i there's optic diff and bump have got like mm -hmm. breaking change detection on their on their documentation deployment which I'm, i've been doing some writing for them recently and it's quite a cool one where you just kind of like deploy your docs, keep on deploying your doc, put it in the, put it in the pull request and just keep on deploying your docs when they go to master. And then on your pull requests, it can go, well, there, there's a break and change in here. Is that something that you wanted to do? Or like, this has been removed, that's been added. And it's really nice to see more people getting into that. Cause that's one of the hardest problems in APIs is if y'all break, if you, if you change stuff, things are going to break for your consumers. So how have you gone about stepping into the world of, of API changes and what problems are you trying to solve? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, it's it's exactly that. It's how do we know? And this is another thing. There's another problem. But again, it's, it's with my day job. I've always I've wanted to build this. I've actually built it before with VMware. But this is a very real problem. Is devs aren't because there's no testing, there's no compliance validation, there's no quality assurance on on these open API contracts. They're making changes, or they're changed automatically through code changes if it's code first, mm. and it gets deployed. There's no testing, and a customer it gets broken. I was like, well, well we, we read the contract and it's not working. And we're breaking each other. We're breaking product A to product B, the integration points between them because the teams just aren't, they don't know, they're not following. They're, the, the dots aren't connected. Yeah. So first, you know, you, the, the change detection only works if you are using the open API contract as that source of truth. And when you are, you know, you, you want to know exactly what has changed. So there's, there's, a, there's other tools out there like, like it's great tools like OAS Diff that does, you know, the same thing. You put rules in there. The, the thing that I noticed though, with a lot of these diff tools is I, I, I'm, I'm getting like a, like you would get with vacuum. You get a straight list of all of the violations that have occurred. And it's, it's when there's, there's a lot of them, it's a well, okay, Where in the model has that changed? Because that property, mm -hmm. that name ID is used 10,000 times. <laughs> and I don't know which, I don't know where it is. And if I can't see it, if I don't have a visual representation of it. I'm struggling to get the gestalt of what's actually changed. So oh, that was I the see. approach that I took with open API changes. Is it's actually more of a visual rendering. So it does two yeah. things. It, the, way, the way it works, it, it reads in the model from both A and B. Then it does actually every single object as a hash check against it. So it takes the object, hashes it and just says, has it changed? And if it has changed, it looks at every single property what was added, what was removed, and decided if it was, you know, is it a breaking change? You know, if you added like a, a non-optional parameter, things like that. And then what it would do is render out those changes as part of the model of the open API document. So you can see the mm. paths, you can see the parameters that were added, you can see where in the structure it was changed. And then you can flip it. And instead of just looking at a tree, you can look at a graph. Like it actually renders out a visual graph. I was really inspired nice. by a tool called jasoncrack.com. And it allows you to feed in a JSON file and it will visualize it, it broken apart. You can see it. Well, that's very, very good. That's very useful. I would like to see that, but with something that's not just a JSON file, you know, a, a, a data structure. So I took that same idea. 
I used all the same library. In fact, I built this all in React just so I could make it work with tool oh, things. Nice. I loved it. And yeah, we recreated that same experience. But now instead of rendering out just a JSON file, it's rendering out the change tree. So you can see the open API document as a visual graph and explore it that way. And you can rotate it, you know, and we'll get all different layouts and stuff like that. But so it's a visual way to explore. And also it then it gives you the ability to go back in time. So you can not only see you know, the change from where you are today, but you can see where it was previous, before that. And then it gives you some graphs and charts of how it has changed over time. So it's, it's like a local tool right now that will give you that with the, whether you've got a local Git repository, it will look through all of your revisions, it will just do a left or a right, mm. or it can pull straight from GitHub and pull down all the, the revisions for that. You just literally point it at the open API file and pull down all the, all the, the commits that you've had and then nice. do diffs for every single one up to a limit. You can, you can limit it to five or 10 or whatever, but mm. it was a different experience that I was missing. Like, I want to see what's changed over time and I want to visualize it. I yeah. don't just want a, a straight list of violations here, then like, like a, you know, like vacuum or spectral when it's something more visual. So that's, that's the difference of how it works. It you know, gets custom built. It doesn't use any other existing libraries other than the open API. And it walks the model as a hierarchy. So it gives you a hierarchical rendering com complete with, you know, line numbers and columns, which is also missing from a number of other tools that don't give you line numbers and columns. They just tell you the path to where it changed. Absolutely. Well, yeah, that's, that's back to what I said about some of the pre-spectral stuff in it, where, yeah, people are like, I, I read all of your files into this massive array. Now go figure out where in this massive array, array it went yeah. wrong. You're like, that's yeah. not helpful. I need to fix yeah. this. So yeah, I think some of those tools were kind of designed by either very small teams that didn't have a chance to like really get into it or were kind of designed by people that aren't as in the trenches doing open API stuff all the time. So therefore didn't really realize the importance, like, Hey, yes. our product manager's happy, but <laughs> for the people that actually need this to solve actual problems, aren't, aren't so impressed. So that's, that's pretty handy. I do wonder with some of this stuff with like the breaking changes in open API, like I feel there's a, there's a little part of my brain that's like, did we create a problem for ourselves where originally a lot of the tools that I didn't like so much would keep open API completely separate from the source code. And you know, maybe some, if you're doing code first and then you just render it, render out some open API and bug it somewhere, that's whatever, that's a bit different, but as, yeah. as well, a lot of people will export the open API from their code. And it goes into the repo. And if you're designed first, it lives in the repo. And then you actually use it as the source of truth, maybe mm -hmm. for testing, maybe to power some of the code. So either way you go more often open API lives in the repo so that, you know, when you make a pull request, any changes that happen will happen to your open API and therefore your docs and your hosted mocks and everything else all at once, all along with the code. So it's a bit more atomic, but a way that things worked before that was, yeah, you, you've got your code over here and you've got your contract testing suite over there. And that meant that if you made a breaking change, then it would probably notice like the completely separate contract test suite would, would kind of notice because you hadn't updated that. And it was always really annoying. If you, if you make an intentional change, then, then it breaks your contract test suite and you have to go and change that. So that always kind of annoyed me, but it, it does at least kind of then give you some protection against that happening. But since we've moved it all into the repo, you can easily just like delete something and it breaks for everyone. And it goes, yes, I've contract tested with myself and I've agreed that I'm correct. So <laughs> <laughs> even though I'm not what the clients want and, that, and that's where tools like Pact come in, right? Cause then the, the, the consumer has to set up their own contract testing, which isn't, you know, the, the producer is hi, my API does what I think it should. And then consumer testing is like, does your API do what I think it should? And I can, you know, the consumers can test for the bits they're interested in. But if, if you have change detection running, then. You can, I don't know if open API changes does this. Some of the diff tools do where your consumers can actually subscribe to changes and get like an email when changes come out. And I don't know that's if you know, that's idea. probably something you could automate something that, <laughs> something that bump does. And I really like that because it, it, it solves both. I've not needed to make this really annoying blocker where, you know, your contract testing is totally separate from your code and you constantly have to go and change it in two different places, but you haven't also forced all of the work onto your consumers to find out whether you've broken shit recently or not. Mm. They can find out what's mm. changed. They can find out if they care about it. And, and that's a, a powerful thing for change detection, I think. But yeah, that. Yeah, it is. It's it, it, it very powerful. And it's a, it's a big problem, right? Big yeah. problem is like how, do, how, do, how, how do we you know, find the balance there? 
I like that idea of, you know, like a Slack or a message email or something. Mm. OPM Exchange doesn't do any of that stuff because it's it's just like a local tool. It has gotcha. no kind of network connect. I mean, it, it does some stuff. <laughs> yeah, there's no like, uh, put your emails, no subscriptions yet. No, that's cool. Yeah. Well, we've got more to talk about here because you've got, lo- you've been busy. You've been really busy. We <laughs> have been talking about three open source tools that you've worked on and they are powered by Lib Open API. Now, yeah. do you just enjoy writing code or why, why does that exist? So, yeah, so it's, again, it started with this, all the tools that I've seen out there, they're missing some of these key pieces that I need to be able to build the tools that I want to build. So I'm still trying to build the tool that I want to build and all the bits that I need to build it haven't, they didn't exist or they didn't exist in the way that I needed them to. Mm. And I started with vacuum and lib open API was born inside vacuum. And it was, how do I, how do I pass this open API file in go? So there's already a great library out there, like kin open API. And that was my, just was like, why would I reinvent this? Why would I redo this work? <laughs> and I went to the, plug it in, but there's, there's, there's a problem. There's two problems, actually. The first problem is it's a fundamental design problem. The way that it, when it passes in the model, it loses all the context of line numbers and columns, ah, yeah. which is critical in my opinion, for being able to do change detection and show you yep. where things have changed. And then with the, you know, being able to build. Same thing for linting. I need to know where it is to be able to say, here's the problem. Mm. And it doesn't have that. And it won't be able to have that because of the, the way the architecture put together. So the only way to do it was to literally rebuild it from scratch as a, like a compiler, passing the abstract, abstract syntax tree, which is, you know, the raw YAML effectively, yeah. or the raw JSON, and then put that into a model that captures all of that low level information. And there's things like anchors and aliases and comments in YAML that all get lost. And you need to know about all of the sources of that and where it was come from, particularly doing like references. Anyway, that's why it exists because first of all, there was no line numbers and columns. The second thing is that Kin doesn't support 3.1 yet. And that, Damn. Does it support 3.0 was, even? It does. Yeah, it does support oh, okay. 3.0, but simply because it's got its own JSON schema model. Right. The problem is, is we know exclusive minimum, exclusive maximum, you know, went from Boolean yeah. to and things like that. Or well, nullable stuff. Unless you've yeah. got like, like ability to do dynamic objects, which is what we have in Lib Open API, you're kind of stuck and you've got to rebuild the whole thing again. Yep. And that's kind of where the project is. It's uh, you've got to rebuild the model to be able to make this work, which is just, it's just too much for some maintainers. So that's why I, I built it because it, what I needed didn't exist. And we, I wasn't gonna be able to get to 3.1 support mm-hmm. and you know, it's a useful tool by itself. So live it just inside vacuum when we, people don't want to do linting, they just want to be able to pass the model or do de- diff checking programmatically. So that's, that's why I built it and that's why I exist. And yes, to answer your first question, I love coding, love coding. Just like you purpose. really enjoy writing the really just uh, like difficult under the hood, low level, just like writing some code that in, into in, like inspects YAML anchors. Like most people don't even like working with YAML anchors, but you're like, let me write some code that. <laughs> mucks about with this you're a masochist yeah yeah <laughs> yeah part you know part of the challenge is can, can i even do this do i am i good enough to do that and you know <laughs> that then there's the there's something there's something really rewarding about you know when you're working in these high level experiences and you're you know, rendering you know graphs and charts to be able to trace the, all the way down to the the code that literally read those bytes in from the spec mm. and know that tree is something very rewarding about that to me you know have that, that's awesome that over that, that full, that full view. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's a lib open API. It's the heart of all the tools. It's, you know, it, the ultimate in dog fooling, if you will, is like every single piece relies on this. So when all these things break in these higher levels, it always usually traces back to a problem in lib open API to the point now yeah. where it's pretty robust. There's no real open bug reports. Kind of, there's a few, but maybe it depends on how you look at it. There's, there's, there's always it, some things. Yeah. There's always some stuff in there's, there's, there's a few things in there, but it's, it's actually the point where, you know, if I wanted to be able to cut a 1.0 release, which is kind of very rare, but yeah, yeah exciting. It's, well, that's, that's is, brilliant. Yeah. And so you, you're doing this, you're doing this all as a side project. And uh, one of the questions someone was asking APIDs was like, how sustainable is this? Like, is this just a hobby that you'll get bored of? And so that brings us to the next topic, which is. Kind of, you're building like a SaaS and a suite to tie this all together. How, yes. how does that work? Yes. So like that, so all of the individual tools, you know, they're useful in their own purposes, but they're all designed as they're, they're tools that you download them, you own them, you run them, you modify them, they're, they're yours forever. 
But then there's the idea of, well, all these individual pieces are valuable, but what if it was all put together? You know, the, the idea of a suite that that's, they're all in, they're actually designed to work together. They're all built in a way that they all click together. So it's being able to do quality analysis and have the ability to edit rule sets and, you know, and then be able to visualize your contracts and see your schemas visually. It's another thing that we're kind of lacking on. You know, mm. there's, there's tools out there that will visualize to a certain degree, but like, for example, if I'm designing a whole bunch of schemas in an open API, how can I take a look at the, the class hierarchy and hierarchy, sorry, in, you know, in some form of UML, you know, maybe in UML, but you get to the point is how yeah, do I did visualize it? How do I do change detection? How do I do mocking and testing? How do I do compliance? How do I do validation? Having that as part of one tool that, you know, works as a desktop app, but also is available as a SaaS platform. So it's got its own full API. And then it means it can be introduced into things like GitHub Actions. All of those functionalities that you use as the individual tools now become available as a service or as a suite that you can, you can download. And then moving that forward and offering, you know, really what I want to focus on is the upstream elements of all of open APIs, focusing on the contracts, not necessarily the artifacts that are generated from the contracts like SDKs and, you know, docs to some degree, but yep. it's really about maintaining, you know, giving you visibility into the contract. A lot of, it's inspired by a lot of the work that Stoplight has done. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I mean, yeah, there's. There's a lot of different verticals, right? So there, we talk to a lot of tooling vendors on this podcast and I'm usually asking them which bits they're going for because Jason Harmon from Stoplight did a brilliant piece about how you can't do every vertical well and anyone who tries is delusional or lying. And it's not, not those exact words, but something along those lines. And it, it definitely it definitely checks out. Like there's a lot of companies that kind of do a certain vertical as a checkbox activity and, and it's just it's sad for everyone. But it, yeah, it seems like so focusing on kind of linting and mocking and, and validation. And that's, that's already quite unchanged detection. That's already quite, quite a blooming lot, but it's, it's all areas that aren't massively well served currently. I mean, yeah, th there's a lot of tools that kind of go for it, but they've all got primary focuses elsewhere. So e even if you kind of do put in some, some docs, I mean, you know, that's not, that's not the hardest one. Once you've got some open API, you can render it with a pretty interface. So like everyone does docs and something else, but yeah, that's, it's an interesting series of verticals to go for. And it's good that there's a plan to get some money involved to help you work on that. Cause it's not something you can do well if it purely evenings and weekends, not, not in yeah, that, yeah. not in that sweet it, well, sense. Like you can make the tools and give them out to people, but gluing it all together. I, I compare it to like, you know, I want, I want a set of cutlery and, and, and I just got a knife and I'm like, all right, well, let me just whittle for the next two days <laughs> and I'll have that. But like, not everyone wants to do that. They don't want to go, all right, let me plug this into this part of the CI and then that can do these other 12 steps, you know, glue it yeah, together for yeah. me, please. Yes. Yes. It's the glue. Yeah. I'll, I'll, here's a service that sticks it all together for you and gives you, you know, a lovely set of interfaces, easy APIs to integrate with. So you're right. Yeah. It, it, it can't be something that just stays as evenings and weekends. That's my long-term goal is to turn it into a business I can yeah. work on full time. That's, that's where I, that's where I want to be. And, you know, it depends on the reason what I'm doing this right now is validation is would people even pay? Would they be interested in, mm. now there's users of open API, there's all these companies that use it, but are they going to fork out? And I know that model exists because, you know, there's through the success of companies like Bump or Opta yeah, yeah. or Speakeasy or, you know, Stoplight being acquired, definitely yeah. a, a market for it. I just wanted to see, first of all, would people be interested in using my tools first? Sure. That seems to be, you know, validated to a degree. Now it's, let's, let's yeah. make it better. It's pulling the gas. Exactly. I mean, that's, I think, I think something you mentioned when I saw you talk was like, if people, if people start paying and you can afford to bring somebody on, then that's, that's something that, you know, you'd like to do and start to expand it. And that, yes. that I think is really interesting. Like my, my background, when I'm not messing with startups, I, it's mostly bootstrapped, right? Like, uh, yeah, I, I worked for WeWork, definitely not a startup. They like to pretend they are and they had the ping pong tables, but obviously a massive corporation. But before that, loads of, loads of bootstrap companies and, and small startups and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool to see you go in the bootstrapped approach and, and looking to grow, but also s starting off still with so much open source, because 
the balance for most of these tooling companies is if you make everything so that people have to pay you a thousand pounds a month just to start using it, you have a really hard time getting people to start using it because it's it's 100% like enterprise sales team driven and you've got to get those big enterprise contracts and you yeah. have a lot of functionality. So it's a massive chicken and egg. But then if you have open source, you get a lot of developers using it and some of them might start paying for it. So Stoplight's approach was we've got, you know, I can't really put numbers on it, but it felt like kind of 20, 25% of our effort would be like entirely open source, like, you know, issues that only really affect the open source projects or are primarily asked for by open source. And so you're kind of like making that stuff out there in the open that people can use, but then it's also powering your paid products. And not only does that mean that, you know, some people might be contributing bugs that then improve the experience for the, your paid users, which is cool, but you're also like getting people hooked on the free stuff and then not, you know, then you glue it together for them and that, that brings them in. So it's really interesting to see a one man army kind of just go, well, I'll just start off with open source in bloody everything and figure it out later. <laughs> like I really kind of just like that. It's, it's bold. It's a bold <laughs> choice, but it seems to be working. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's going in the right direction. That that's for sure. For mm. now, you know, any, anything can, anything can come along and derail anything, but it, the, the hunger's there, the, the audience is there, the interest in open API is growing. It seems there's a friend of mine who he mentioned, he calls it like an evergreen. It's an evergreen field, mm. you know, in 2016, I remember, you know, there was, you know, coming off the Ramel versus swagger wars and you know the conversation was like what we need to invest in this this is important we should care about this so even then you know the same conversations are happening and we really haven't made huge amounts of progress towards right. actually getting this solved you know at, at the company level there's lots of individual companies doing this really well but large enterprises are still mostly absolutely terrible at this so it's, there's this field where there's evergreen there's always a need to improve here and my opinion is that open API is like it, it is the key to rest. Like it's just, just to say that we, if we're going to do rest with open API, sure. There's other DSLs out there in other languages, but it's, it's the one that everyone, every company has settled on. I, I don't see anyone talking about any of the others. <laughs> exactly. Just doesn't need to like, we don't necessarily need to think it's the best. It's the one that stuck. <laughs> yeah, it's VHS, yeah, but, right? It's the VHS. Yeah, exactly. thing. It's, it just, we, but laser discs were one. cool. <laughs> yeah. You could use them as giant, dangerous frisbees as well. Yeah, I mean, the last, the last, I think, two podcasts we've done, we we had Daryl Miller and Vincent, whose surname I forgot. I'm sorry. I, I I got really cocky that I knew everyone's names and then and then went for <laughs> it. But uh, but Lorna Mitchell as well. And we were talking about Moonwalk a little bit. Like, yeah, there's there's a V4 open API coming. Um, and I do want to dig in more to see how that is looking because I'm, you know, there's going to be a big change for a lot of tooling developers and it's, it's rough to see like this massive, massive improvement in tools happening recently. Like I set up openapio.tools because everything, everything was kind of shite. Like a lot of the open yes. source space was, we, we were all like, they were all really small tools and everyone was like, you know, little, little dodgy projects with like three stars. And it was all, yeah. we'd all, we were all really just a young ecosystem. And everything was coming off of like Swagger 2 and the getting ditched and starting over in, in Open API 3 because it was so different. And, and it just felt like at that time, so much of the cool, flashy, works really well, looks really nice, has good marketing, is really battle tested. So much of the good stuff, all of that effort was just going into different communities. It was all going into GraphQL and they were making cool stuff. And they were like, screw, screw rest, the shiny stuff's over here. I was like, you could make, you could do all of that over here. You've just chosen to do it over there. And now we're kind of yeah. stuck with nothing. But over the last couple of years, like the, the tooling has, has grown up so much that I like have absolutely no envy for those folks over there and people are starting to come back and you know, the hype mm -hmm. cycle on GraphQL is coming down and, yes. and, and the, the tooling here is maturing to a really good spot. So I love to see the competition in, in the different spaces and verticals happening to push everyone forwards and the focus on, on just like good looking websites and good looking tools and good looking simple things that plug and play together. So yeah, I'm really excited to to see where it goes. And I just, I hope that the OpenAPI V4 isn't a, a big drop kick between the legs of the progress that we've, we've all been making on that front. So remains, remains it, to be seen. It's quite as, it's quite as significant. The, yeah. So the moonwalks from what I've seen from the early, early specifications, it's, it is going to, it will be a nuclear bomb being dropped yeah. on, on the dev community, but particularly with the existing tools, it's, there's lots of JSON schema support, which is great. Yep. Yeah, but yeah, it will take some time. I don't, I don't even know how 
close we are to you know full adoption of 3.1 yet there's still you know a huge yeah. amount of 3.0 spec still being created today but anyway yeah it's fun to see where it goes and i'm glad that it's moving you know it's, it's the fact that we've got the workflow specification that's almost there that's yeah. that's really big overlays as well is an interesting thing that's For not sure. quite there yet but like companies like speakeasy they've already gone ahead and you know adopted some of the like live open API, they've already built their own kind of extensions for it nice. to support overlay. I think so anyway, I'm, I'm guessing. They support overlays and they use live open API, so I'm guessing they've done that, but. Perfect, maybe yes. <laughs> no, I was playing around with the speakeasy implementation. It's pretty, pretty good. Yeah, so there's loads of cool stuff coming in open API 4 and the kind of open API connected ecosystem with these working groups. And we've talked about that in previous episodes. We'll have to talk about that more in future ones because this is getting close to being, well, this is, we did it. It's a podcast. Thank you so much for coming and talking about all this stuff. We, we could have gone for Thank like two you. hours, but we'll, we'll, we'll make life easier for the editor and, and, and get out of here. But thank yeah. you so much. Thank <laughs> Pleasure you having you. Cheers. Appreciate it. Cheers for the chat. Bye.